Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Doc. I'm the uh, chief medic for the uh, St. Louis Battalion of the Missouri Militia. Also past president of the St. Louis chapter of Oath Keepers and currently serving as a secretary for <laughs> Oath Keepers. On my background, I'm a doctor of chiropractic, also licensed in acupuncture, and um, in addition, I've taken a um, lot of uh, training in uh, medic and the combat survival and topics like that. I'm also a prepper, also go by Survival Doc. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of my websites is survivaldoc.com. And at the very end of my presentation, I have a slide where I will, um, yeah. <coughs> Um, I'll have a slide at the very end uh, showing you my various uh, websites. I've been doing prepping back uh, far, as far back as before prepping actually became uh, the end thing to do. But today my topic is hygiene, sanitation, and preventative measures. I don't normally use a script, but when they told me I only had 20 minutes to talk today, I said the only way I'm going to manage that is if I stick to my script. Uh, and, so, and also I'd ask that you hold your questions till the end, and if I have uh, time for questions at the end of my presentation, I'll take a few. Otherwise, we're going to have a question and answer, answer session at the very end of today's seminars. Hygiene, sanitation, and preventative measures for preppers and survivalists for when the stuff hits the fan. There we go. First, a couple of definitions. When we talk about hygiene, we mean the things that you do to keep yourself and your surroundings clean in order to maintain good health. Sanitation, the promotion of hygiene and prevention of disease by maintenance of sanitary, i.e. clean, conditions, as by removal of sewage and trash. And the important points to take away here are maintain good health and prevention of disease. It was Benjamin Franklin who said it best, an ounce of prevention is <coughs> worth a pound of cure. And we all know that this is true, but how much more important is this truism for us preppers and survivalists? When the system goes down and our access to doctors, drugs, and heroic medical procedures is impaired or cut off. I'm going to discuss some war stories today, and you may wonder what war stories have to do with prepping. Well, war obviously involves many survival situations that we can learn from, but the conditions that occur during wars are often similar to the conditions that we would expect in a grid-down scenario. There will be a breakdown in basic sanitation, and the body's natural defenses will be reduced by fatigue, exposure, and stress. So what can we learn from Napoleon's invasion of Russia? Of Napoleon's 600,000 man army, only 100,000 returned to France from Russia in 1812. They were destroyed by guerrillas, disease, and cold injury, which forced ret retreat. There were 70,000 combat losses, but 430,000 from disease and non-combat injury. It is estimated that over 100,000 soldiers of Le Grand Army were lost due to Laos-born typhus. <coughs> which was lousy luck for Napoleon. <laughs> That's my best joke, but I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. So while there were 70,000 losses from combat, Napoleon lost 100,000 of his men due to this little critter right here. Next, we look at the War for States' Rights, which if you're from the Deep South, you know that it's a war of Yankee aggression. <laughs> Actually, it was a takeover of the U.S. government. Okay. <laughs> we want to elaborate on that. Okay. There were two soldiers died from disease and other non-combat causes for every soldier who died in battle. And of course, the war also, this doesn't include civilian uh, deaths. Historically, in every conflict up through World War II, in which the United States was involved, approximately 20% of hospital admissions were the result of combat injuries. The other 80% were the result of disease and non-combat injury. In some areas, the incidence of disease was so severe that entire divisions became combat ineffective. The reasons for the vulnerability, harshness of the environment, 
The body's natural defenses reduced by fatigue, exposure, and stress. Breakdown in basic sanitation. Again, these are the same things I expect to see in a grid down, in a prolonged grid down scenario. In case you have trouble making this slide out, this is a, a GI drinking from a ditch right here. All right, this would be where your uh, handy little life straw that Pierre was talking about would come in handy. Life straw basically is, is a straw, it's about, it's about this big around, but it's a straw you can stick down in water and you can drink any, any water except salt water. Uh, but it contains a ceramic filter impregnated with charcoal. And it's something, I've got several, I've got them in my car, in my bug out bag, uh, but that's a handy water filter that all of us preppers should have. The field sanitation team was the Army's response to the breakdown in sanitation and the resultant increase in disease that our troops have experienced during the years. The first field sanitation team was established during World War II to provide for control of insects, malaria was a big problem then, proper disinfection of water, always a problem, safe food supply, and sanitation. The top medical threats identified by field sanitation teams are heat, which is the most lethal because it kills people in the quickest amount of time, cold, such as hypothermia and frostbite. Here's a picture of a nasty case of uh, frostbite. And one thing I mentioned about frostbite is uh, the, the thing, uh, when you, uh, someone experiences frostbite, the best thing to do is to warm it up as quickly as possible, even if that means sticking the, the hand, say, in, in the hot water. Um, but when that occurs, um, when it begins to thaw out, though, there's swelling. It's, there's not only pain, but there's swelling. And so if the person is wearing a ring or any kind of constrictive jewelry, you want to make sure you get that off before you treat frostbite. <coughs> Number three is biting insects. Our insects or arthropods kill more people than all other animals combined. And what arthropod means is uh, basically it's a category that includes insects plus, if you remember insects are six-legged critters. Uh, arthropods includes uh, ten-legged and eight-legged critters like ticks, uh, scorpions, ten legs. But anyway, these mosquitoes, ticks, bees, scorpions, fleas, flies, and other arthropods. More deaths than all other animals combined. Here is a partial list of vector-borne diseases. Vector-borne <coughs> means that it's a disease that is carried by a vector such as a, uh, an, an insect. All right, of these, uh, the ones I have highlighted here, I want to pay particular attention to Rocky Mountain, Spider Feather, Lyme disease, and um, and ehrlichiosis, ehrlichiosis, ehrlichiosis. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I mention these is because these have personally um, struck me. Uh, I know a man who actually died from Rocky Mountain, Mountain, Mountain Spotted Fever uh, in Arkansas. He got hit by in the Arkansas Ozarks. Uh, personally, I have Lyme's disease. A lot of people in uh, Missouri have Lyme's disease. And also, I have a friend of mine who's currently going through 30-day antibiotic treatment because he has this disease right here. So most of us know people who have been hospitalized from tick bites. And the fourth top medical threat identified is diarrhea. All right, I personally, I think diarrhea is going to be, in a, in a grid-down scenario, I believe diarrhea is going to be uh, is going to result in more deaths than any other cause. All right, and the reason for that being a compromised waste disposal system and resulting contamination of our drinking water. Okay, when people have to start going to the bathroom outdoors and their toilets are backed up because there's no electricity to keep the pumping stations running, what are they going to do? They're going to go outside to go to the bathroom or they're going to go to the bathroom inside in a bucket or something to carry outside and dump it. All right, they're going to be contaminating the same water supplies, the streams and ditches, that the rest of us are going to be trying to get our water from. If you don't have proper water uh, purification methods, then you could end up with dysentery, which is a cause from amoeba uh, in, uh, in con contaminated water. Uh, so, uh, dysentery is almost always from food or water. 
It can inca incapacitate an entire unit and is prevented by good hygiene, washing, and a safe food source. All right, in the time we have left, I'd like to explore some basic preventative medicine measures. These include water disinfection, as I mentioned, as Pierre talked about today. Very, very, very important. Food service sanitation. Waste disposal. I mentioned uh, how people are likely to dispose of their waste. And most of us preppers are going to be educated enough to know how to properly dispose of our waste, right? We're going to bury it, right? We're going to dig a latrine, or at least we're just going to go out the post hole digger, make a hole, and we're going to bury it. All right, the average person out there is probably not going to do that. Maybe a few will, but it doesn't. It won't even take a, 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 a few to actually contaminate all the water supplies out there. And personal hygiene. All right, and individual preventative medicine measures, which we'll explore more in just a minute. Our preventative medicine measures against arthropods and rodents. Again, you have basic sanitation measures of clean up the conditions in which the rodents and arthropods thrive. All right, keeping yourself clean. If you're out in the woods and you, uh, when, you, when you come in, first thing you should do is take a shower because actually you can wash off a lot of the, uh, the ticks say, that may be on your body before they even have a chance to attach to you. All right, here's one tick. This is what you should be looking for, of course. Um, if a tick, and after you take your shower, you should inspect yourself carefully um, and, and make sure that you don't have any of these little critters attached to you. If you remove these things within 24 hours, even if it's a disease-bearing uh, tick, you're not likely to get the disease if you remove it within 24 hours, even if it's attached to you. Here's a little thing that I have ordered for Amazon.com. It's called the Tick Key. And um, I use it every day to take ticks off my dog. Just snip the hole over the tick, and you drag it, and you can remove the entire tick, you know, mouth parts and all. Individual protective measures, such as DEEK and permethrin, all right, here's a fellow applying D. I know it's deep because it's applying it to his skin. Permethrin is not something I normally apply to, to uh, my skin, uh, but it's great for treating your clothes with. Um, places like Bass Pro, Cabela's, sell a form of permethrin in a spray bottle. And what you do is you take your clothes and you hang them up on the clothesline and you spray them down real good and you let them dry for at least an hour before you put the clothes on. And this stuff stays on your clothes, they say, up to six washing. Uh, but anyway, I personally use that. I've, I've, uh, some of the exercises we do out in the, uh, the woods, before I started using this product, I came home one weekend, and uh, with the help of my wife, we found 16 ticks that were attached to my body. All right. When I started treating my clothes with this, I don't get any. Very, very, very effective. It's pretty toxic, though, but, you know, so are ticks. But it's, so I wouldn't put this on, on my skin. Mechanical and chemical controls such as traps and poison. And I'd like to tell you the story about uh, <coughs> Black Death or Plague, because we can learn something about this from this story. The Black Plague or Bubonic Plague is estimated to have killed 30 to 60 percent. So you could say roughly 50, uh, 30 to 60 percent, which is roughly 50 percent, the figure I like to use, of Europe's total population, half of all of Europe was wiped out. It took, uh, I read somewhere, like three centuries before the population of Europe got back to pre-plague pre conditions. What was the cause? This little bacteria right here, your Cinetestis bacteria. What was the cause? The flea. The bacterium was carried by this flea, and uh, the flea bites transmitted it to, to people. Or was it caused from the black rat? Because the, black, the fleas were carried by the black rats, and which were pro prolific uh, during this time period, especially in the cities. Okay, here's the real cause, in my opinion. 
it's the conditions which allowed for the multiplication of the black crack. This is from a history book in the 1970s. Household waste, sewage, leather pairings, rotting vegetables, and any other rubbish was thrown into the gutter and ran down the center of the street. Here it accumulated in rotting, rat, and germ-infested stinking heaps until a violent rainstorm washed it out. Sounds like a situation we could have in a grid, in a prolonged grid down scenario, right? You have that in New York during a garbage strike. I'm getting yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> could this happen again? <laughs> <coughs> well, Tim and I think alike. It's one of my six good buddies. Um, and how many are you, of you are old enough to remember the London strike, garbage strikes in 1979? I remember them very well. All right, the garbage workers weren't on strike for just a couple of weeks. And this was the result in London. Okay, you think this type of scenario could occur in a grid down scenario if your um, garbage collectors are interrupted? They can't make, especially in cities, if the garbage collection is shut down. Could this happen again? It's just a matter of time. <coughs> okay, so in, in conclusion, and some final thoughts that I have for you. Here are the take home points I want you to take home. Do what your mother told you. Wash your hands, change your underwear, eat right, don't smoke, beware of strangers. And also I'd like to add, drink clean water, in other words, purify your water, stay hydrated, and dispose of your waste properly. And in case you do end up drinking some uh, bad weather, bad water, or you know someone who does drink some bad water, and you end up with some diarrhea, all right, here are some re remedies for diarrhea. Of course, one thing you can do in your storage as a prepper is you can s store some diarrhea medicine, all right, but what, if, what about when your medicine runs out or when you're someplace where you don't have your medicine? Or you can drink tea. Will Rindy Snyder please come to the checkout desk? Rindy Snyder. You can drink tea made from the roots or leaves of blackberries and their relatives to stop diarrhea. I like this one because, as you all know, blackberries are everywhere in Missouri. And they're easy to identify, and the most effective part is actually the root. All right? So even though the fruit may only be available during you know, certain months, mm -hmm. the root is always there 12 months out of the year. You can dig it up, chop it up, make a tea, steep it in the boiling water, make a tea, and drink that. You can also stop diarrhea by eating white clay, charcoal, or campfire ashes. And one thing about diarrhea is if you can maintain your electrolytes, it is self-limiting. It will eventually go away on its own uh, if you can keep your, yourself alive long enough for it to go away. So drink electrolytes, stay healthy. Here's a recipe I like for uh, making recipe uh, making uh, electrolyte drink. Uh, two parts sea salt, one part baking soda, and one part potassium. If you just remove chloride, if you just remove that. Two parts sea salt, one part baking soda, one part potassium chloride. Potassium chloride is available in any grocery store. It's known as light salt. They sell it for people who are on a restricted sodium diet. Real inexpensive. One little container will last you forever. What I do is I mix this up and then I keep this um, in a bottle in my, in my backpack. And when I need to make a rehydration drink, I just take one teaspoon of this out, add it to a quart of water, mix it up, and good to go. Here's another one of my favorites, activated charcoal. Is, uh, I, is, I keep this in my survival supplies. You can make handmade charcoal, homemade charcoal, but it's not activated when you make homemade charcoal. Campfire ash, ashes, as I mentioned, uh, not charcoal briquettes. All right, here are the websites I mentioned. is uh, my survival website, survival.doc, uh, also naturalhealthschool.com. Uh, combat medic dot training, and I'm also uh, responsible for the St. Louis Oath Keepers website, and there is the URL to that. And here's my email address if anybody wants to contact me. And I see, according to my trusted little timer here, that I'm right on <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Doc. So, I ask you to hold your questions.
So to the, to the end of our presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. Thank you.